Good morning. Welcome to Catalyst and our Sunday online service. If you're joining us today for the first time, I'm John Murray, lead pastor of Catalyst Vineyard Church in Ithaca, New York. And today we are on part two of our 12-week summer series entitled Faith Full, Fueling Your Faith in a World on Empty. And in this series, we said last Sunday that we're going to use two resources. The first is the book, Don't Give Up, by Cal Eidelman, written in 2019. And the second resource is the book of Hebrews. And the book of Hebrews, we said last week, was written by an author unknown to Jesus following Jews in Italy. And it offers us insights into number one, who and what should we place our faith in? Who and what should be the subject of our faith? And it also gives us a definition of faith. It says that faith is believing that God is and that he will do what he has promised. And that's in the beginning of Hebrews 11.1. 1, and it goes on in Hebrews to give us this list of by faith examples, what it calls a cloud of witnesses. And we're going to read about that in Hebrews 12.1, where it says this. It says, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. And it basically is saying that you need to fix your eyes on the subject of your faith, the who, which is Jesus. And it also says there's this great cloud of witnesses. And when it says that, I believe that this cloud of witnesses should be a source of motivation, inspiration, and accountability. Now, it should actually be more than just someone who sees something. It should be someone who says something. These witnesses aren't just in the stands watching us, and I think sometimes we picture it that way, but they're actually voices that surround us. It's these voices that are saying, don't quit, keep going, keep believing, keep fighting. And last week, we learned about two of those voices, the voice of Enoch, who walked with God for 300 years, and the voice of Abraham, who kept believing God's promise for a son, despite the fact that his body at age 100 and Sarah's body at age 90 were as good as dead when it came to having kids. And so today, we're going to hear about another voice, another voice in that cloud that surrounds us, the voice of Jacob. But first, our Catalyst worship team is going to share two songs of worship, and then I'm going to come back and share today's message. I am broken, I am bleeding, I'm scared and I'm confused, but you are faithful. Yes, you are faithful I am weary, I'm believing God help my unbelief Cause you are faithful Yes, you are faithful I will proclaim it to the world I will declare it to my heart I'll sing it when the sun is shining I will scream it in the dark You are faithful you are faithful when you give when you take away even then still your name is faithful you are faithful and with everything inside of me I am choosing to believe you're faithful I know we're sure to come Cause you are faithful Yes, you are faithful I've dropped anchor in your promises And I am holding on Cause you are faithful God, you are faithful I will proclaim it to the world I will declare it to my heart I'll sing it when the sun is shining I will scream it in the dark You are faithful You are faithful When you give When you take away Even then Still your name is faithful Yes, you are faithful And with everything inside of me I am choosing to believe you're faithful 
searching for answers far and wide, but I know we're all searching for answers. Only you provide, cause you know just what we need before we say. Have you ever experienced a situation that you would describe as being deep, down, and dark? Actually, those words are the name of a book, a true story that was written about 33 miners that were trapped underground in a cavern for 69 days in the San Jose mine in Chile. And this is back in 2010, and some of you may remember this situation. But these miners were separated from the Earth's surface, from light, from food, from friends. They were separated by a mega boulder that was the size of two Empire State Buildings. And in that situation, they were only given a 2% chance of rescue 
and survival. And I think when we're in those kind of desperate situations that are deep, down, and dark, we tend to run the game film on our life. We tend to think about the decisions we've made, the good decisions, the bad decisions. And then we also begin to think about what's going to happen if I die. I mean, what is death going to be like? And that's what these miners were thinking when they turned to the one person of 33 who was a Jesus-following miner, a guy by the name of Jose Enriquez. And when they turned to Jose, they said, Jose, you need to pray for us because that's our only hope. God has got to get us out of here because we have just a 2% chance of survival. And when, he said, when they said that to him, Jose said, well, you guys need to gather around me in a circle and you need to go down on your knees and I'm going onto my knees because we need to humble ourselves to God when we pray. And they began to pray. And then he said to them, we also need to confess our sins. And so they began to out loud confess their sins to one another. And then Jose said to them, guys, if we're gonna get out of here, if we're going to hope to actually get back to the earth's surface, we need to make a commitment. We need to make a vow that if God saves us, that we're gonna turn our lives around. These things we've been confessing, adultery, alcoholism, all the things that we've been talking about that we've been doing, we need to turn and repent of those things. We need to have our lives redeemed. And as he shared that to these men underground, they began to make that commitment. And, and here's the thing, they were in an underground ca cavern that was really more like a coffin, that became like a church, that then became like a place of redemption. And I think that's how God writes our stories sometime. And it's actually how God wrote the story of a guy by the name of Jacob. And that's the next story. That's the next voice in the cloud that we're going to be listening to. And Jacob is the grandson of Abraham that we learned about last week. He's the son of Isaac, and he's the son of Rebekah, which was Isaac's wife. And Rebekah initially could not bear a son, but Isaac prayed. And it says that then Rebekah became pregnant with twins, two boys. And it says that they were jostling. They were sort of wrestling inside of her. And she turned to God and she said, why? And here's what God said to her. And the Lord said to her, the sons in your womb will become two nations. And from the very beginning, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other. And your older son will serve your younger son. And when the time came to give birth, Rebecca discovered that she did indeed have twins. The first one was very red. In other words, the skin was red at birth and he was covered with thick hair like a fur coat. Probably not who you would be texting pictures of to your friends. So they named him Esau, which means Edom or red. Then the other twin was born with his hand grasping Esau's heel. In other words, he came out of the birth canal holding onto the heel of Esau. He was number two, but he wanted to be number one. And so they named him Jacob. And Jacob means heel grabber or supplanter or actually conniver, one who actually plans on how to win and how to deceive somebody else. And that becomes true in their lives because Esau, he becomes this hunter, this outdoorsy kind of guy that is actually Isaac's favorite son. But Jacob, Jacob is Rebecca's favorite son. He's a homesy kind of guy. And, and he actually stays home watching the cooking channel so that he can cook good meals. And, and that's sort of the nature of these two. But don't forget, Jacob had tricks. Jacob would outwit Esau constantly. And the best two examples of this is when, first of all, he outwitted Esau for his birthright. And he did that because when Esau came in from one of his hunting trips and he was super hungry, he came in and, and geez, Jacob had been cooking an awesome stew. And when Esau smelled that stew, he said, I'm just, I'm starved, I'm famished. And, and Jacob said, well, I'll give you my stew, I'll give you the stew if, if. And he did a trade with him, he bartered with him. He, he said, let's make a deal. And he basically said, you give me your birthright, I'll give you my stew. And Esau, it says that Esau despised his birthright. He actually undervalued it. And he came back, I'm sure, to regret that trade, but he made that trade in the moment. He made that trade out of his appetite at that particular time. And the second example happens later when actually Isaac is older and Isaac is actually near death and he's actually blind at this point. He cannot see. And so at this point, he says to his son, the oldest son, Esau, he says, Esau, he said, I want you to go out and go wild game hunting. I don't want you to come back and cook me an awesome meal. And if you do that, I'm going to give you my blessing, my paternal blessing is going to go to you, Esau. 
But Rebecca overheard that challenge. He overheard, she overheard that option. And she, she loved Jacob. And so she took Jacob aside and she said, hey, we've got to beat Esau to the punch. So I want you to go out and get a couple of goats and bring them in and I'm going to cook them up. And, and, and then we're going to take the hair on those goats and we're going to put it on your forearms and your hands and around your neck. And that way, when you go in to see Isaac, you'll be able to pose as Esau because you're going to smell a little bit. And Esau sort of smells. And if he reaches out, if he doesn't recognize your voice and wants to feel the hair on your arms and on your neck, he'll be able to do that. And so actually, that's exactly what they did. And when that happened, Isaac thought that Jacob was Esau. And he gave Jacob the blessing, the paternal blessing. And then when Esau shows up, Esau shows up and he's like, hey, I'm here. I got my game. It's, it's good. It's, it, it's, it's cooked and it's, it's ready to eat. And, and, and Isaac said, who are you? And he said, well, I'm Esau. And he said, no, wait a minute. You've already been here. And then it became clear what Jacob had done. And, and here's what Esau says to Isaac. He says, no wonder his name is Jacob, for now he has cheated me twice. First, he took my rights as the firstborn, and now he has stolen my blessing. Haven't you saved even one blessing for me? In other words, bless me too, Dad. And so Isaac looked at him and he said, well, you're going to live in a location that's not such a great place. You know, it's, it's really it's not going to have the earth riches around it. And, and you're going to live by the sword. And by the way, you're going to serve your brother E. You're going to serve your brother Jacob. And, and so when Esau heard that, he got angry. He, he got bitter because Jacob had taken his birthright from him. And, and because of that, he makes a declaration that, you know what, when Isaac dies, I'm going to go game hunting for Jacob. In other words, little brother hunting season is going to begin. I'm going to kill him. And Rebecca hears word of that. And she pulls Jacob aside and she says, hey, you got to get out of Dodge. You got to leave here. In fact, what you need to do is you need to go east and you need to go to my brother Laban and you need to hide out with him or you need to live with him in Haran. That was actually where Abraham had started from. And so that's what happens. She says, flee at once to my brother Laban in Haran. And, and so Jacob heads east to Haran. And when he gets here, he gets to a well and he meets some of the servants of Laban and he meets Rachel, who catches his eye immediately. That was Laban's youngest daughter of two. And so he, he, when he meets Laban, he eventually says, hey, I'd, I'd like to marry. I'd like to marry Rachel. And, and so Laban says, well, no problem. All you need to do is work seven years and I'll give her to you. And so he does that. But at the end of seven years, Jacob finds out that he's not the only con man in town. He finds out that actually Laban cons him. And, and on the wedding night, he switches the older daughter, Leah, for Rachel. And, and Jacob wakes up to Leah. And, and he goes to Laban. And he says, what are you doing? I mean, how, how, you know, why did you do this? He says, well, she's my older daughter. You have to marry her first. But I'll tell you what, for another seven years, I'll give you Rachel too. But I'll give it to you as a deposit. I'll give it to you up front. And so in that second seven years, as he goes from year eight to 14, Jacob is beginning to become bitter. He becomes a little passive aggressive. And on one hand, he's being nice to Laban, but on the other hand, he's figuring out how to do some cattle rustling, how to do some switcheroo with the livestock. And he's building his own brand. He's building his own collection of livestock out of Laban's. And when he gets it to the point that he feels like he's good to go, he basically says, I got to get out of here before he finds out. And so he actually leaves when there's a three-day journey between him and Laban. And it says this, it says, so he, Jacob, fled with all he had. Because remember, Jacob is not a confrontational kind of guy. And it says that Laban followed him. And when he caught up to him, um, he said, what, why did you do this? Why did you do this? Jacob, and Jacob says, I rushed away. I ran because I was afraid when you found out that I had embezzled some of your livestock. And they had a confrontation there and, and they drew a line. And basically Laban says, don't step over this line again, heading east, because this will separate us. We'll have a truce on this line, but don't step over it again. So now Jacob can't go back east. He's got to head west. And guess who is in the westerly direction? Esau. So he knows that now he has to head in the direction of Esau. He has to go back to where he came from. And, and, and Jacob, like many of us, doesn't like facing his fears. And Esau was a fear. 
And to some degree, Laban was a fear in the other direction. So east and west, he's got a fear in front of him, and, and he's only got one way to go. And, and so typically, he would run from his fears. In a fight or flight situation, he would flight. He would not fight. But sometimes, when we get into these situations like this, there ends up being nowhere left to run. And he knew he couldn't run back to the east. He had to head west. And so knowing that he had to head west, he began thinking about, how am I going to convince Esau to forgive me? What am I going to do? So he sent messengers in front of him. And these messengers were going to take the message that, hey, Uncle Laban, I've been there with him for the last 14 years, and I've become wealthy. And I could probably distribute some of that wealth to you, Esau, if you forgave me and gave me your favor. And so what happens is he sends these messengers, and they come back and they say this. We met your brother Esau. And he is already on his way to meet you with an army of 400 men. Jacob was terrified at the news. They were coming to kill him. He divided his household along with the flocks and the herds and the camels into two groups. He basically figured, I'm going to divide my assets. And that's why if he gets one of them, he won't get the other. And then he does this next step, which should really be all of our steps. It was a step that was taken in the deep down and dark story that I told you, in the bottom of that mind, what did they do? They prayed. And so, East, uh, so Jacob prayed, and here's what he prayed. He said, oh Lord, please rescue, save me from the hand of my brother Esau. I am afraid of him, that he is gonna come to attack me with those 400 men and along with my wives, Lee and Rachel and children will all be wiped out. But you promised me. Lord, I'm just reminding you of your promise. You said, I will surely treat you kindly, prosper you, and I will multiply your descendants until they become as numerous as the sands along the seashore. Too many to count. In other words, he's basically saying, hey, you gave this promise to Abraham, and it was about stars in the sky, and and, and then you gave it to my father Isaac, and I got his blessing, and then you've also said to me about the sands, that's not going to happen if I get eliminated here. That's not going to happen if Esau kills me. And so he decides next, I'm going to send some gifts to Esau. I'm going to sort of send some gifts to bribe him. I'm going to send them out. And so he's separated. He has now divided his assets. He has two troops that have crossed the river. And he sent these other couriers with assets to take to Esau to meet him. And then now he's also prayed. And so basically he's done all that he could do. And he sort of stayed behind in fear. And he stayed behind alone in a desolate clearing, it says, at a campsite. And then here's what happens in that campsite. In that campsite when basically Jacob's got nowhere else to turn. It says, this left Jacob all alone in the camp. And a man came and wrestled with him until the dawn began to break. And when the man saw that he would not win the match, in other words, he could not out-wrestle Jacob He touched Jacob's hip and wrenched it out of its socket. He dislocated his hip. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. In other words, I don't care if my hip's dislocated. I'm hanging on. I'm in this wrestling match until I get a blessing. And the man says to him, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Jacob. He says, your name will no longer be Jacob. The man told him, from now on, you will be called Israel because you have fought with God and with men and have won. And actually Israel means wrestled with God. And the next thing that happened is that Jacob turns to this guy and he says, uh, what is your name? And, 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 the, and the person says back to him, why, why do you ask? And then he just blesses them and gets out of there. And Jacob calls this campsite Pen A-L. He calls it Pen E-L, which means face to face with God. And I believe Jacob was face to face with the only man God that I know, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he actually wrestled him till dawn to get that blessing that he got because he had nowhere else to go. And what happened that night is that Jacob did not run. He kept fighting. He kept fighting until the dawn. He kept fighting until he got the blessing. He refused to let go. He refused to let go even though his hip was dislocated. And sometimes you need to fight through the night. Sometimes you can be in a deep, dark place. You can be deep down in in a dark place, and and you need in that situation to basically keep fighting and not give up. You need to keep fighting and, and, and not say no and quit. You need to keep fighting in that situation because sometimes 
You know, in order to get to the fight and to get to the blessing, you have to go through that night. You have to go through that dark night. And so basically what happens next is that Jacob heads west to meet with Esau. And when he sees him at a distance, he kneels down. Jacob kneels and puts his head down in a humble, in a humility situation and just hoping that perhaps Esau will forgive him for everything he's sent and everything he's tried to do. And, and when Esau gets here, he picks him up and embraces him and he's forgiven him. And, and actually the fears that Jacob had to some degree at that point were unfounded. Sure, Esau had been angry, but he was no longer angry. He had forgiven Jacob. And, and so sometimes when we are on the verge of giving up, you're only one fight away from God's presence in God's blessing. You're so close, but yet you don't know that. And that's the situation that Jacob was in. He was so close to the blessing of God when he fought with him that night. And finally, he got that blessing. And your DDD or your deep down in dark situation may be a hospital waiting room. It may be that you're waiting for someone that you love to find out if they're going to live, or it may be a funeral home. It may be that your wife or your husband has put you out of the house in a hotel. You might be staying in a hotel or you, or you might be seeing divorce papers in front of you. Or you might be in a courtroom or you might be in a prison or you might be reading a rejection letter for the college that you'd aspired and had worked so hard to go to. But here's how Kyle Eidelman puts these deep, dark down or deep down dark situations. He says this, you feel hurt, you feel overwhelmed, you feel helpless, you feel lonely, you feel scared. More than anything, you want to get out and run. You just want to have this thing end. You would pay almost any price, accept almost any deal that offered you an escape, a button that you could just push and you would be out of the situation. I understand that. But instead of running, maybe it's time to fight. If you'll grab hold of God and refuse to let go, if maybe like Jacob did, if maybe like the miners did, if you'll go down on your knees and pray, you'll find that there is a gift, an opportunity for you there to discover God's presence, his peace, his strength, his purpose, his grace, his light, his life, his blessing, his story for your life, your God story, your pen e -L story, your story of having a God moment in your life, could be only one fight away, could be only one night away. And that's why this message is entitled Keep Fighting and Don't Give Up. It's not just keep believing sometimes, it's more than that, it's keep fighting. And so before we end this plane today, before we end the message, I wanna circle us back to our Discovery Bible study. And in the Discovery Bible study, we've been saying that's how, that's how we're going to build an enduring, go-the-distance faith. In other words, we've said that this is how we're going to focus on God's Word as a catalyst to grow our faith. Just like Peter, in his letter, in his first letter, he basically said this, as newborn babes long for the pure spiritual milk of the Word, that by it you'll grow to salvation. In other words, God's Word can help you grow and develop no matter what age, no matter how long you've been a follower. And then we're going to take a look at the book of Hebrews. And I'm going to encourage you to read as an assignment this week, Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 18. I, I'd actually love to see you read it in three to six translations. And you say to me, Coach, how am I going to do that? And you say, all you need to basically do is go to www.biblegateway.com. They have over 60 translations there. And you can go from one to the other for whatever verse range for these verses that I'm listing right here. And it makes it simple. You don't need to own six Bibles. You can actually do it very quickly there. And what I want you to do then is I want you to do a DBS on Hebrews 2, verses 1 to 4 and 14 to 18. Those eight verses were the three-column study. And in the first column, you're going to put a column that says the Scripture. You're going to rewrite what it says in whichever translation you prefer. And then second, you're going to rewrite it in your words. You're going to retell it in a way that if you were sitting with somebody having coffee, that's the way you would tell what you've read. And then third... You're going to say, if this is true, and maybe you don't yet believe that the scriptures are true, but if you're going to say, if this is true, this is what it would mean to me in my life. This is what I would need to do to change or to obey what the word says. And I want you to do those three things and then get together with at least three or four other people and maybe even eight. And I want you to get together and I want you to share the scripture, read it, 
Retell it in your words and then say what your I will statement is. And Father, I pray that just like Jacob found you in that deep down dark moment of his life, when he was facing Esau, who he had cheated out of his birthright, who had cheated out of his blessing, I pray, Lord, that you help us run to the actual roar of a lion, that you help us run into the fight instead of fleeing, as Jacob did in his earlier years. That just like Jacob's name became Israel, that means wrestled with God, I pray that our names would be given in a way that would show the testimony of you changing our life, giving us a new identity. Amen.